Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in each of our hearts be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. For weeks, I had ignored the same little alert on my computer. Windows needs to update some applications. Would you like to restart now? My answer was always the same. No. No, I don't want to restart. This little message invariably came when I was in the middle of something I didn't want to pause long enough to lose, or when I was in the middle of a Zoom worship service, or at a time when I just couldn't handle thinking about one more thing. I always press that little button, no, restart later. Now is not the time. Well, I finally updated it, and guess what? I immediately regretted it. It took almost an hour. I thought it was going to take five minutes, and it made me late for something. And then it moved a few things around, changed a few buttons here and there, so that for a week I was stymied by some of the basic things I used to be able to do. This was, of course, my fault. I didn't take the 10 minutes it would have taken to figure out what had changed, to be led through the tour of my new processing system, to be shown how these changes could help. Instead, I complained about the new technology and slipped ever closer to being an old lady curmudgeon. And I'm not saying that any of you out there are old lady curmudgeons because you have found your way through some technology that I have resisted. Really though, I'm starting to wonder, why does everything have to be updated all the time? Why does everything have to change all the time? And I'm not just talking about the computer system. I'm talking about all of these messages that, that we've been getting back and forth, up and down. You can have Thanksgiving. You can't have Thanksgiving. You can have school. You can't have school. Why can't we just find a system that works and stick with it? and just go off into the sunset with no more changes ever. Anybody wanna sign up for that one? We've been through more changes in this past year than I think any of us could have ever imagined. And change is hard. It's a psychological fact. Change is really hard on people. Even good change is hard on people. And the changes that the pandemic have forced upon us are starting to wear on even the most hardy souls. I'm hearing some, some cracking happening all over the place and feeling it myself. I'm waking up in the morning thinking, I'm just done with this. I'm tired of this. I just wanna eat Thanksgiving dinner with a couple of people that I don't live with. Is that too much to ask? Well, yeah, actually it might be, at least this year. I know we've changed Thanksgiving plans. I'm betting you have too. Maybe you're seeing a couple of people, but you're doing it safely and you're doing it with masks and tests and quarantines and all the rest. We're not able to have the big boisterous celebrations that many of us look forward to. And we're not sailing into the Christmas season full of hope and excitement and joy. Instead, this thing is dragging on and a lot of people are exhausted and the adaptations take time and energy away from other things. And there are plenty of days where at least I want to go back to the good old days. Except of course that the good old days, if you look at them, didn't really exist. At least they weren't all that good for a lot of people. One of the things that the coronavirus has exposed and that I don't want us as church to lose sight of is just what we've seen about our society over these last nine months, the inequalities in the way that the economics of this time have hit people, the ways that racism has been so exposed over the last nine months, and on and on. We are still sitting in the midst of some of the, the very hardest things that we've been sitting in all along. And although I will lead the charge on not actually wanting to change. I think God is telling us we have to. We have to change and we have to keep changing. We can't go back to living with our heads in the sand. We don't live in a bubble of security. 
We can't just go back to our guilt-free lives. Today we hear the prophet Jeremiah's call to change and the response from the king and the response from God. It's a confusing piece of scripture. I will admit the first few times I read this in preparation for this week, I thought, let's not read this because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and then I cut some of it because it was really, really long what was given to us and it still didn't make a lot of sense. And then all of a sudden, a few days ago, I was studying it and it was like this whole world opened up and I thought, oh, I think I need to do a whole sermon series on this. There is so much here. Let me just peel back a few of the layers of what's going on and then, um, and then continue with the message. This is from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was active over a span of four different kings, different political leaders, probably 23 or 24 years in time that he was really an active prophet. There was a time period in which the people of Israel experienced um, hardship and then they were overthrown and taken into into exile, into captivity. So it is a time where um, absolute destruction of everything that they held near and dear has happened. And Jeremiah's job as a prophet is to speak God's word of truth to God's people with the hope that they would change their ways. And he's not only speaking to God's people, he's speaking to the power brokers of God's people, to their leaders, to their rulers, to their priests, to their kings. His words in Jeremiah, they often sound harsh and sour, sorrowful. It is a very hard scripture to read. And at times, Jeremiah turns up the volume, predicting such massive destruction and sorrow that I just want to close the book. Jeremiah was so committed to this vision of the truth, and his vision was so hard to hear that he was not allowed into the temple. Imagine that, a prophet of God not allowed into the temple. If you ever think we're living in unprecedented times, just read Jeremiah. You'll know there's nothing new under the sun. So in this passage, Jeremiah isn't allowed into the temple, but he still has this word from God. He writes this word on a scroll and he sends his scribe, Baruch, into the temple. And in a part that is omitted in our reading, Baruch is, um, gives his message and people tell him, you got to leave. No, if the king gets word of what you've just said, you are in trouble. You and Jeremiah should go into hiding. Baruch leaves the scroll and flees from the temple. The king does hear about this message and the king asks for it. And so one of the king's servant picks up the scroll and brings it to the king. The king, a king that probably a few of you have heard of, and I can't pronounce, Jehoiakim, I believe is his name gets this scroll. Now this king is, um, is the worst of the worst. He is somebody who has these huge palaces while his people are suffering. He is a king who has not tried to unite people or to save them from external destruction. He is a king that has instead just allowed them to have all sorts of devastations while he amasses his own personal wealth. We get an image of that wealth actually in our scripture where it says um, the king sitting in his winter apartment. This might be like saying the king sitting in his very Tony estate on Martha's Vineyard or some such thing, an indication that this king is really sitting in luxury while the people around him are hurting. The king gets this scroll and he gets this message and in just this cinematic image of a king using his power against the word of God. The king takes the scroll and cuts off the words as they're spoken and sends them into a fire, burning them up. Some have called this the original book burning. The king doesn't like the message Jeremiah has, and why would he? Jeremiah is basically saying, everything has to change starting with you or God will destroy you. The king thinks he can destroy that message, and he does for a time. And then God says to Jeremiah, write it again, write it again. And guess what we have in our Bible? The book of Jeremiah, the longest book in the Bible. Jeremiah wrote and he wrote and he wrote and he wrote some more and that scroll was not lost. The scroll was recorded. And in that scroll, there are some harsh words. 
there are some hard things for people to hear then and for people to hear now. The people have forgotten God. They have been unfaithful. Bad kings are condemned, but so are the people who enabled them. So are the people who amassed their own wealth, knowing that others were suffering. So were people who misused the earth's resources, causing drought and pollution. Pestilence is mentioned over and over again in Jeremiah as a form of judgment and as a way that the evil in society has been exposed. And there are bone chilling words about the patterns of injustice that are passed down from generation to generation, inherited sin, a sick society. All this stuff sounds almost contemporary. The words of Jeremiah are harsh, but they also contain this nugget and a few others like it, this nugget that comes from Jeremiah 31. And if you're asking yourself right now, why did we read Jeremiah 31 after Jeremiah 36? Did anybody notice that? Two reasons that I, three reasons that I can come up with. One is the people who put this together told us to. Number two is that Jeremiah is not written chronologically. It is pieced together um, and scholars think that actually the book of Jeremiah uh, 31 is written after 36. And because the original scroll was burned, 31 was written after 36, even though it takes place before. Anyway, you don't need to know all that. What you and I need to know is that in the midst of this destruction, in the midst of this exile, in the midst of a people destroyed and divided and sick, Jeremiah promises a new covenant. Jeremiah says, you will have this word and it won't just be written on a scroll. It will be written on your heart. You will be my people and I will be your God. You have the law within you and you don't need anybody else to tell you what this word is. You've got it. Your sins are forgiven. Your iniquity is no more. Essentially, God is saying in the midst of all of this, your future is secure. Your future is secure, not because of who you are, but because of who God is. I have to tell you, my computer just did that thing again. It's like it's trying to make the point. <laughs> anyway. I want to tell you a story about God's word being written on someone's heart. You see, this message of Jeremiah is, is way too often interpreted as a me and Jesus kind of thing, that we each have access to our own sense of Jesus, that Jesus is as close as our own hearts, which means that we don't need anybody else or a community. It's true that we have this intimate relationship with, with God, but it's not true that it has nothing to do with other people. The point of this Jeremiah passage is that God's word cannot be destroyed. God cannot be destroyed. God's power can't be destroyed. God's love cannot be taken away. A friend of Peace Lutheran Church, some of you that somebody that some of you may remember if you've been around here for a while, is a pastor named Antone Gebra Selassi. He was a guest pastor for us many times. Um, he himself comes from Ethiopia and he now serves a church in Kansas. He's a Lutheran pastor. He gave me permission to share this story about the power of God's word not being able to be destroyed. He went to school in Ethiopia during a time that um, the power regime forced churches to go underground. It was not allowed to have a Bible nor to meet as church. Think about that for a minute. Imagine if everything we were doing right now had to be underground. This is the experience of an awful lot of Christians throughout time and history. He and his friends, I think it was in high school, they would gather during breaks at school and they would have books open as if they were studying history or geography or something. But really they were taking turns teaching each other. One of them would memorize scripture at home and then bring it to school and teach out of that scripture. They couldn't have the written word with them. And yet they so powerfully in community heard the word of God alive. 
It kept them going and nourished them. It gave them a vision for what the kingdom of God could be like. It gave them a hope for the future that they knew was possible because of God's love. And to look at Pastor Antony now, who is preaching out of that word, and think of his beginnings as somebody who heard the word of God in a kind of surreptitious, secretive way, because the word of God will always find a way. It's amazing. This is what the prophet Jeremiah is saying in contrast to that king. And this too is what I think Jesus is saying. Jesus gives this new covenant to his disciples. Very soon, Jesus is going to die. He's going to be crucified. And those disciples, if they're anything like me and probably you, they may have thought some covenant. This thing just got destroyed. This is what, not what we were thinking was going to happen next. This is a kind of change that is utterly undescribable in their history. And yet, Jesus would not stay crucified. And God's love will never stay destroyed. It will never actually be destroyed. It is a force and a power that comes over and over again. And burning it up and ripping it up, you can't take it away. God's power and God's love reigns. And that's what we mean when we say Jesus is king. We don't mean all these awful images of kingship. We mean the one who is at the center of the universe for real and who shows that centrality and shows that reign through love and through sharing and through generosity and through sacrifice. We are going through enormous changes, but we haven't even gotten started yet. The things that are going to be required of us as the people of God over the next years are huge. But we have this thing at the heart of what we do all the time, which is God's loving presence, beckoning us forward, helping us adapt to whatever it is that we need to adapt to, to prophesy into whatever it is we need to prophesy into so that God's word can be revealed for more and more people to see. Jesus is alive. Jesus has never been destroyed. Jesus is the one at the center of our lives. And Jesus is there through it all. Thanks be to God for our unchanging King. Amen.